young researchers in ERMI. I'm Andrea Mattia, the ERMI representative, together with Dorota Lember in the ERMI board. And we are just waiting another two minutes just, just to see if other people can enter in the room. Uh, we will start very soon. Okay, so we are ready to start. It's time to begin our webinar. So, as you will see during the webinar, the, the page that you see will change according to, to the part of the webinar in which we are. So for a very short general introduction, this is the very first webinar organized by Yermi, and I have to give you a couple of disclaimer. First of all, that the webinar is going to be recorded, and that's for sharing the, the webinar with those people that are not able to attend it right in this moment. While you that are in the room, uh, you can interact with the presenter. Today, we are very lucky to have Arthur Butter, from the Utrecht University, who is also the editor-in-chief of Educational Studies in Mathematics, one of the main journals in, uh, in our field. The topic of the webinar will be writing a journal article. So Arthur, we are glad to, to listen to you. Okay, hi everyone. I'm very happy that I got this uh, invitation from uh, from Yermé, um, so uh, we're glad to see that so many of you are uh, interested in hearing uh, the webinar. Um, I will uh, briefly introduce what I'm going to do and then uh, start. So I have uh, four main topics uh, that I prepared, starting with skeletons and um, talking about introductions and other parts of papers and then uh, talk about if the, uh, research questions and overall coherence. So this, this part will be about an hour, and then after which we have questions for um, about half an hour. Um, in between, 
feel free to ask questions about the specific part that we are addressing. If you, if I use an, a term in English that you don't know, feel free to type the word with a question mark, and I will try to explain it. Or maybe someone behind the the, the scene, like Andrea or Dorota or Silan, will be able to help here. But uh, don't. Uh, wait if you don't understand. So uh, I will do blocks of presentation. I will address a few questions that I see in the question box. And then at the end, we have time for the overall questions. So the, the questions that you can type in are mainly meant to be about the specific topic that I'm addressing. So I think I have done my introduction. So we can uh, open the PowerPoint. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah, so why, why do I care so much about writing journal articles? Well, for me, writing is an essential part of research. If you do a lot of research and you learn a lot yourself, but you don't share it widely in a transparent way, then the research is not finished. It's, uh, it's uh, well, it's not really research. Um, at the same time, I see a lot of manuscripts coming in to journals about which I think, yeah, maybe this was wonderful research, but it's not clear or it's not convincing or the contribution is not clear or the writing should be better to be understood by an international audience. So um, I really care about writing and uh, I know it's not easy, but it can be learned. And that's, uh, I think, a few tricks and tips will help a lot. And if you keep practicing, um, this would uh, enormously help. So what I do um, in this uh, webinar is to share some of my ideas about how you can structure a journal article. Um, I do this on the basis of workshops I'm, I have given also at Yerme this year. And uh, I really hope to invite you to to think about text in, in functional terms and in a, in a more abstract way, uh, to think about chain of reasoning of a text. And um, yeah, I will primarily talk about empirical articles, uh, so based on, on data, but I'm happy to talk a little bit also about theoretical or methodological papers. But uh, empirical ones are the easiest to talk about first. I will. Yeah, so what is a paper? Um, I often uh, think of a paper as a hyperboloid. Hyperboloid is a, a terrible term for people who don't speak English as their first language. So this shape, you draw people into your research from a wider topic, you draw them into your study and then uh, present your study and then relate your findings to uh, the wider world again. So. Uh, the beginning of a paper has to be like a funnel and at uh, the end as well. Now, what I plan to do is talk about certain aspects of uh, papers and uh, what I call a skeleton or if you like an outline or a chain of reasoning. Introduction, so how to draw uh, people in and theoretical backgrounds and as I said, research questions and coherence. And um, I'm not sure how long each part will take. It also depends on the questions, but um, I think five to 10 minutes for each part and then 10 to five minutes for, for uh, questions and answers. So I'm going to start with the first part, which is what I call a skeleton. Now, empirical articles typically have certain ingredients that the that the reader is expecting to be there. Even if they have never learned about this in an abstract way, uh, readers expect certain information. And there is like a logical order to it. And I must say as a disclaimer that um, this is sort of a typical introduction or a typical skeleton. Um, so I offer this as a way, if you don't know where to start, try this first. And of course, uh, often you need more creative lines of reasoning uh, and uh, have to deviate from the standards. Uh, but this, this is something I've noticed works very often, especially in education. 
So let me start with the first ingredient that the reader would like to know about. So what is your problem? Why do you care about this? What is the challenge you want to achieve? What's your educational goal or maybe unused potential? Something you want to achieve or resolve? Now, of course, you are not the first and only one caring about this topic. So others have also tried solutions or meet this challenge or reach such goals or and what have what have they tried and what is then unknown about this? What is still relevant to know about this new idea? Um, and this is how you come to your knowledge gap. And a knowledge gap, mind you, is not just there is no research on this. A knowledge gap also has another half to it. Why should we care about this? Uh, why is it important to know about this issue? Now, if you have identified your knowledge gap, and uh, normally your research aim follows quite easily from, from this gap. Now, if you have an aim, you typically also have a research question. And mind you, some, re some reviewers, um, if they don't see a research question, they reject the paper. That it's a, a, the key to the, to the study um, and possibly sub-questions. Now, you don't do this in a void. Typically, you have a theoretical framework or a theoretical background or a conceptual background, whatever you would like to call it. And um, so you need to define key concepts. Now, where you do so in the paper depends on your judgment. If you have a technical term, you have to bring it early. But if it's a, a more common term, then you might do the definitions and your particular take on it a bit later. Now, not surprisingly, we have a part on methods and results and conclusion and discussion. And not saying you should do discussion, uh, discussion, conclusion, or both together. I, I don't want to go into the, that, but typically conclusion, discussion kind of things come last. So these are skeleton issues and ingredients that people expect or want to read about. Now, this is just sort of ingredients. And if you want to order those, you have, there could be multiple things at stake. So let me start with one thing. Um, what I see sometimes, uh, and it could work very well, is that you say, start with your research aim. Boom, this is my aim. And you can, you can do so if all terms in your research aim are clear. If you use technical terms or something quite special, you may need to bring the reader first to um, what your aim is about. But the nice thing about saying this is my aim is that the reader is on the right track from the very first sentence on, onward. Now, as I said before, definitions can be required quite early in a text. Say if you want to use the term scaffolding, but not in the loose sense of support, but really temporary adapt adaptive support uh, with particular uh, characteristics, then you may have to define it quite early on. Um, sometimes the third bullet, uh, sometimes people make a, a separate section that they call the present study. So they've introduced all the literature and things that are relevant and then, okay, but this study is about this. So that could also be a key ingredient in the, in the outline. Another element you can think about in terms of the skeleton is uh, what I call a reading guide. So at the end of an introduction, you uh, sometimes see what is coming in the rest of the paper. Now, if you do standard thing of a theoretical background methods results uh, discussion, you don't have to provide a reading guide because you don't do anything special in that sense. You, you follow common conventions. But if you need something special, if you change the order or if you have something different, then you may have to tell the reader a little bit of what you're going to do. Now, one of those things um, that I often talk about with my students is where to position the research questions. Now, I personally have a preference for the end of the introduction. 
um, because you don't want the readers to wait too long before they know uh, what this is really about. But sometimes you need to go through a lot of things explaining your design rationale or uh, go through all kinds of issues, conceptual issues, before you can really properly ask your research question. And then it comes typically just before the method section. The nice thing about this place, just before the method section, is that uh, if you have the question, it's quite logical then to move to the part how you're going to answer it. But the disadvantage can be that it takes a few pages before the re reader knows what is going to be asked. Now, let me move on. Um, yeah, so that was the first part on um, the skeleton. So I'm going to ask, have a look at uh, questions that have come in, if they have come in, because we are now the first part. And if there are no questions, then I will just continue because actually part two is very much related to what I've been talking about so far. I don't see any questions, so I will move on to uh, the second part on writing the introduction and, and background. Um, so the first option that I li quite like and see a lot is to write quite a brief introduction uh, of say three to five paragraphs and then elaborate more. So the nice thing about this is that the reader in one page has a quick overview of all the key things uh, that they know they want to know about. Um, but separating a brief introduction from a, a longer theoretical framing can be that it is um, hard to avoid uh, repetition. So then you need to be quite general in the introduction and more specific in the theoretical background. And sometimes your, your issue is so complex. I think with teacher education, for instance, the, the problems you want to address with teachers are highly related to problems with students or a broader school infrastructure. And if you need like a complex story to get to your very specific aim and question, then you may need a longer introduction. Then your problem is layered. So that's the other option, a longer introduction in which you do the key ingredients of the skeleton and the theoretical framing in one go, so a, lo a longer funnel in the hyperboloid. Um, and as I said, this is often necessary uh, if you have more complex chains of reasoning. So are there any questions about um, oh, <laughs> I think I made a mistake in uh, in in this. Um, it's only now that I'm ready with the first part. I don't see questions, so I'm uh, ah. I see one. Uh, should I should be uh, they named differently? Ah. You mean the two types of introductions? Well, this is an interesting one because uh, the guidelines of the American Psychological Association state that you should not call your first text introduction, because by definition, your first paragraphs will always be introduction. You don't need a heading called introduction. Um, however, some journals have uh, numbered headings, and what people then typically advise is to call to use a heading that covers the content of the section because the term introduction is quite uh, um, empty so to speak um, so um, it's a, it's a very good uh, uh, question uh, i would say avoid the term introduction even if you see it a lot but try to find headings that really cover what you're doing in the text and I don't think it matters a lot if you uh, 
have the one or the other option. Um, I hope this answers your question, Laia. Would it be correct to leave it without a heading? Yeah, in, in journals that follow the APA um, guidelines, uh, it's uh, uh, even common practice to leave out the term introduction. But as I said, uh, journals like ESM and other Springer journals and Elsevier journals, they um, number the sections and then you need a number for the first section. So then I would try to think of a, a title of the section that covers what's uh, behind there. Okay, thank you, uh, Laia. I'm moving on to um, part two, and uh, to be a bit more specific, how to write uh, these parts. And as I said, uh, these are just suggestions for where to start. Um, and I also would like to emphasize um, that sometimes students think, okay, if I follow this, I uh, should have my text. But um, this is not how it works. Uh, I'm currently writing a paper that we already had nine different introductions, like, okay, should we try this? To, I, I, what works better, this way of uh, getting to it or that way? So it can take quite a long time and you should be willing to try uh, different introductions. But what is nice about the conventional way is that it has been used a lot. So readers expect a certain stepwise approach, uh, plus you cover the ingredients in a, a logical order. Now, so let me start with one that is quite famous, the move step model, which is like a funnel. Um, and I'm saying, that I don't like the terminology, but it's a very uh, common one. I don't like it because it's so military, but let's have a look. So what they say is you establish the research territory, so the terrain about uh, which your research is. And if it's modeling or problem solving, doesn't matter, and you cite the relevant research. Then within that, you identify your knowledge gap or weakness, and as I say, you carve out your niche. You say, okay, this is my part of the terrain, and you occupy it. And this is the term I don't like, but um, it's what you're writing about. It's your goal, it's your question, or your hypothesis. And that's why they call it a funnel. You go from a broad terrain to your particular part in the terrain. Now, I uh, was talking earlier about the issue of starting with the aim of their purpose. Um, and this is what I see more and more. So the, the aim of this study was boom. And after that, you get the traditional funnel. Now, I've called this the upside down pair. Uh, I don't know if I can point to. So, so this would be. Um, I, oh. <laughs> How do I grab this? Hmm. Uh, the arrow is not in the right place. It should be at the top of the pair, but I can't uh, move it in the, the... Yes, thank you, Dilan. <laughs> so th these are two ways of, um, of uh, doing it. Now I have made my own um, reformulation of that. Uh, what I told you earlier about is that try to start with the educational problem. So what is an important to topic, our educational goal, uh, which is still difficult to uh, to achieve? Uh, and what have people tried to reach those goals or to solve this problem, etc.? And what is then the third part? It could be a different paragraph. What is then the knowledge gap? What is unknown and yet important to know? So here you see the skeleton, a large part of the skeleton comes in a logical order. And as I said earlier, from that knowledge gap, you can formulate your aim. Now, the aim is generally um, broader than your research question. It could be that your aim is to advise the field about how to achieve a certain learning goal or how to use particular tools, but that your research question is about a specific way you did so, and evaluative of how successful you were. Um, so don't uh, feel you should 
have both an aim and a research question if they are too similar. But if you do have both an aim and a question, I would say make the aim broader than the research question, more specific. And um, then sometimes after raising your question, you could say something like, okay, yeah, if we know, i sorry for the L there, um, if we know about this answer, it would help to address the problem mentioned earlier. So that's a kind of nice feeling of a full circle. We had a problem, we zoomed in on an aim and a question, and with an answer to this question, we have a partial insight into the problem mentioned earlier. And that could be your introduction. As I said, this can mostly be done quite uh, yeah, concisely and briefly in like one page of three to five paragraphs. And as I said also earlier, uh, if you do it this way, you need to be quite general so that you can zoom in later in the theoretical background. And you, of course, need to think, what are the technical terms that I need and where do I define them? Now, this may be a lot of information if you have not thought about texts in this way. But um, let me move on to some ideas that may help for the theoretical framing. Um, yeah, so a theoretical background or conceptual background or framing, whatever you would like to call it, can be done in different ways. So one way is uh, assume that you talk about multiple teaching approaches or multiple themes. You can have like a section 2.1 about one theme and 2.2 about another, etc. You need to think about the order. So that is a theme-wise structuring of your theoretical background. Uh, then another way of structuring it is to go from far, international, to close, your own group or your own work. And you could also uh, write more or less chronologically. So if you think of transfer, Thorndike, more than 100 years ago, for instance, then you say, okay, we had this person, Alice, who used the term transfer, but it has been criticized by Jean Lave and others. And I take this perspective on it. Then you work chronologically. And of course, these are not completely separate uh, things. You can combine them. You can work in principle by addressing themes one by one. But within one theme, you could work from far to close or chronologically. Now, just as a, a point of uh, attention, um, the, the language of English has certain rules about tenses, so time issues. So um, it's, uh, it can be very important if you say something in the present or the past tense. It has a very different meaning. And it is good, especially for us as non-native speakers of English, to be aware of this. So just to give you a sense, I'm not going to <laughs> into a language lesson, but just to highlight this because I sometimes see things going wrong here. Uh, you use the present tense for facts. This is the case. You use the past tense for a specific study. So um, and these people found this or in the method section we used an interview scheme, etc. And the present perfect like I have studied is or people have found and that is for general findings, not from a single, but from multiple studies. So uh, researchers have so far used questionnaires, but I'm going to use observation, for instance. That is when you need the present perfect. So we are at the end of part two on introductions and theoretical backgrounds. So I'll have a look if I see any new questions. Um, I don't see new questions, but um, I'm happy to return to anything. So I will. We will have time for uh, part three. Um, 
let me take a small sip of water and then jump into the issue of research questions. Um, I always uh, tell people to first ask what they want to know, um, because uh, you can get stuck into um, the issue of, oh, is this a good question? No, first start, okay, what is it really what you want to know? And it might be that it is a researcher question rather than a research question. So I've made this distinction because I often saw students asking themselves or in their proposals asking questions that were really for themselves rather than for research in general. So um, um, it doesn't matter. Um, raise your questions, but uh, you will have to see in the end which of those are for yourself. Maybe there are about uh, things you have to figure out in the theory or a methodological choice. Um, I'm distracted by a question. Ah, okay. Maybe I, we turn um, back to the um, the the issue of the tenses for, for uh, Ruya. Um, so I'm not a teacher of language, but let me try. Uh, the question between past tense and present perfect. Yeah, so um, if we cite Susanna Prediger uh, 2016 on something, we say, this group observed this phenomenon uh, you would not write, they have observed. Um, this is because it is something in the past that happened then, and this is their finding. Um, you would use, if, if it's a more general phenomenon which they observed, and others have too, then you would write, Predinger, uh, and these and these and these have all observed this phenomenon. That is when you use the present for perfect. And it suggests it's a more general finding from research. I hope this is somewhat clear. Um, in one of those references that I had somewhere, yes, Weisberg and Bucher writing up research, they clearly explain this. And there are also multiple very good um, grammar books in which uh, these things are explained. So I hope I've answered this. And I'm going back to Aina's question on conceptual and theoretical framework. Um, I just me mentioned those two terms because I see both. Um, so some people prefer to, to write um, a conceptual framework because what they mainly do is explain concepts. But um, yeah, if you, if you are not so much focused on concepts, but rather theories or, or literature review, that's also another term you could use review of the literature that is relevant to your study, then you use another term. So I'm, I'm not uh, concerned about uh, which term people use as long as, as it fits uh, what they are writing there. So I, I hope I answered your question. Um, then I see the question, should all the keywords be defined or taken care of in the theoretical part. Um, yeah, important important concepts, of course, have to be defined and um, or at least related to the literature so that readers know in what sense you are using a term. For if, if we take attitudes, for instance, there are so many aspects to attitudes and it's impossible to assume that people know what you mean. Uh, there are so many versions, so many questionnaires, so many theoretical frameworks. So you would have to spend a bit of uh, time and attention to this uh, issue. Uh, but as I said earlier, uh, if the introduction is hard to read without uh, a definition, then of course you need to define the keyword uh, quite early on. 
I hope via this is uh, okay. Now, Bustang, um, do we need to have research questions for theoretical research papers? Um, not necessarily, I think, um, but a review paper is different. Uh, I think a review paper, a review study, definitely needs a research question. Um, so, is it different with research questions for empirical research? Yeah, I would say that uh, if you can raise a research question, do so. But with very theoretical papers, you could have an aim or you have a statement, a claim that you want to defend. And it doesn't make a lot of sense then to ask a research question. Rotem, hi. Do you think a glossary could be something usable? Uh, I assume you mean a glossary at the end of a paper. Um, what I'm wondering, though, is how do readers know uh, which terms will be in the glossary? I've never seen a glossary mid in the middle of a paper, um, unless maybe you are writing a review paper on uh, certain aspects. Say, if you are writing about attitudes, I have to have done a review study on it. And then you could make a table with different meanings and different references. Um, and, and, but then it's like your, your findings. So you give an overview of meanings. So thanks for, for all these questions. And to make sure that we do cover other topics, I'm going to move on to research questions. So I will ignore for the next five minutes the, the questions. Um, yeah, so what I was saying that, um, ask what you want to know. Um, maybe that turns out to be a researcher question rather than a research question. So let me specify then what kind types of questions we have. Um, I can think of at least three theoretical questions, which are about clarifying certain concepts or theories, methodological questions, on how do we study certain things in a better way, and empirical. Now, empirical are maybe the most common ones, but you can't um, answer empirical questions without thinking about certain theoretical conceptualizations or methodological issues too. Now, what I've seen is that many uh, students and early career researchers start with uh, re theoretical and methodological questions like, how shall we conceptualize this term? Um, but this is often, in my experience, a researcher question because you have to make a choice. And this will end up in your theoretical background section. It's not a new result. It's your own choice. And the same holds for a methodolog methodological questions. If you wonder, mm, shall I use a questionnaire? Shall I use an interview? Shall I make observations? Those are all questions about myself as a researcher. And your choices are explained in the methodological section of a paper. Now, of course, it is possible that your theoretical question is so important and so new that it justifies its own paper. And the same with methodological issues. If people struggle with measuring something more validly, then you could make this the topic of your paper. But as I said, I would like to concentrate now on uh, empirical questions. Now, there are some, some criteria that you can think of. Of course, um, you need to address a knowledge gap. So the question should not have been answered before. Uh, of course, it has to be relevant and anchored in the literature, precise in the sense that whatever terminology you use in your question has to be defined precisely. M by manageable, I mean that it should be answerable in, in a research study. If it's too complex or outside research, then we can never answer it properly. So you have to make the question small enough to be manageable. 
And one thing that's not so often emphasized is that the type of question has to be clear. Now, what do I mean? Um, I mean that the function of the research should be clear. So if you ask what are the characteristics of, you are asking a descriptive question. If you want to evaluate something, how well, how successful you were, then, it has, then it's an evaluative question. Or if you want to give advice, how something could be done best, then it has to be clear in your question that you're answering or are raising an advisory question. So here's an ex example of an experimental question. So what are the effects of one variable on another? Or in other terms, what's the added value of doing an intervention compared to education as it is now, as business as usual. Um, now, this is, a, this is a question that clearly asks for an experiment. Um, and that's clear from the question. Now, if you would ask what are the characteristics of some kind of phenomenon or to what extent is this the case or how well you are um, formulating descriptive or evaluative questions. So the formulation is really important there. Now, <clears throat> um, design questions often have a different format. They could be um, more like this. So how can an approach with certain characteristics, say scaffolding or modeling or uh, inquiry-based teaching, uh, support some kind of uh, group of people you want to help with learning to achieve a certain learning goal. So how can something help to achieve something else? Or if you like, if you want to resolve a problem, how can this idea I have, this design I have, assist in resolving a problem? Um, so that is, if, if you only look at the language of the question, you, you can expect a kind of answer which has to do with design and advice. An alternative formulation of such a question would be, what is an effective way uh, with certain characteristics CI to achieve some goal G? Now, I hope I've clarified that from the formulation of the question, you should also see what kind of research you may expect in the method section. So that's what I mean by what I said earlier. And this issue at the end, what type of question you are raising, addressing, should be clear. Otherwise, it comes across as incoherent, and I will come back to that later. So I've raised a few issues on research questions. Um, I'm having a look at questions coming in. Um, Elena asked about the glossary. Um, should a glossary be present as a separate part of the publication or inside a text? What's the best way to write a glossary? Well, I'm not talking, I, I hardly ever see glossaries in articles. I do see them in books. So I think you're referring, Elena, to Rotem's question. Um, so I'm, I'm waiting briefly if, to see if questions on uh, research questions come in. Sheng Zhang, are there differences between qualitative and quantitative research in a part of research questions? Yes, I think in the formulation there are certainly differences. So, what uh, the experimental one, what are the effects on X, of X on Y? Uh, from the formulation uh, only, I expect uh, some quantitative study because there seem to be variables. Uh, it suggests a sort of causal relation between two factors. Um, so I, I think it's rare to see such a question in qualitative research, although people may disagree. Of course, you could study those relationships also in a qualitative way. But I think people would frame this differently. So what are possible effects? Uh, or uh, what is the what might be the influence of I think if people see the word effect 
that they will uh, assume a, a quantitative paradigm. Now the issue of how can in design that's impossible to answer only with numbers. So of course quantitative research could be part of it to show that something was achieved pre-post tests maybe um, but the how can has an answer that is by definition more qualitative it has to involve some kind of intervention or design or qualitative description of what was being done so Sheng, thank you for that question why do we focus shireen asks on empirical questions only not theoretical or methodological yeah okay well, uh, the main reason I gave was that um, many journals have more empirical than theoretical and methodological papers in them, and um, that's just a quantitative answer. Um, I think they are quite common. Um, and to be honest, uh, it would be interesting to see more theoretical papers and methodological considerations, but they um yeah i i just see them less often and i think if you know how to write an empirical paper um that's a good uh, starting point um so my experience is that theoretical papers can be quite difficult to write unless you have a background in humanities uh, this is not an official answer of course but uh, i i'm happy to talk later after one o'clock more on uh, theoretical and methodological papers. Nantana, how many questions should be addressed in an article? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I, um, I think it's good to try to have one main question, but of course you could have a few sub-questions or smaller questions. But um, in my experience, don't do more than four because the reader will get lost otherwise. Um, if you, what I sometimes see is up to 12, if students come with 12 questions, then I always say, okay, make these smaller questions steps in your methods section. So still try to minimize one main and say two, three, four maximum uh, sub questions. Um, because that's about what a, a reader can handle and also the researcher. Um, in some rare cases, you see two main questions. Um, I think that is possible, although it's not so common. Um, sometimes you need two studies building, the second building on the first. Uh, then it's fine, in my view, to have two main questions. All right. I will uh, move on to my favorite topic, coherence. I think this is where uh, people can learn most about improving the writing. So coherence is about making sure that everything is logically connected. And it leads to continuity in reading, to kind of some kind of flow. So you must have this experience that um, if you read something good, then you just don't notice the text. You're so focused on the content because everything is clear and it's logically connected. And that's uh, what I sometimes call like glasses. I take off my glasses. I'm, if the glasses are clean, I just see the world. I don't notice my glasses. And the same holds for text. If you read a good text, you don't notice the text because it's not disturbing you. You can focus on the content. So, as I said in the beginning, I am trying to invite you to think of an article in a more abstract way, consisting of all kinds of elements, smaller and bigger, words, paragraphs, sections, etc. But also a chain of argumentation or a chain of reasoning. Now, one of the difficult things um, about text, a journal article, is that it is linear. I wish it would be a bit different, like a web page or so, but you have to tell the reader things in a particular order, and this can be quite challenging. Now, 
The funny thing about coherence, if something is coherent, you don't notice it, you're just happy. But if something is not coherent, it's all too obvious. Uh, maybe you know, maybe you recognize some of those questions or comments from your supervisors or readers. If someone says, oh, this comes out of the blue, I had not seen it coming. Where is it coming from? That's a coherence problem. You had not prepared this well enough. Or if they wonder, what is the line of reasoning here? Or what is the focus? What has this thing X to do with the other thing Y that you're writing there? And related to focus, what is your main message? If people can't grasp the main message from your text, then it's not a unified thing working towards a main message. Another thing you uh, often hear is, Whoa, do you really need this? So some people complain about toppled over book cases. So all kinds of literature, books and articles are cited and then some of them are not so relevant to the rest of the study. So why, why do you need it? Only cite what you need a little bit around it maybe to situate it, but not too much. Uh, it could be that some people say your goal and question are not in line, or what I often see is that sub-questions taken together do not help to answer the main question. So that's another form of incoherence. And of course, it's uh, not so nice if, you're, if you raise a question but do not answer it. So these are very different kinds of problems, but they all have to do with coherence. Now, uh, why do I care about this? Um, well, there is nice research that shows that coherent text is easier to understand and most of all to remember. So if you want your readers to remember and read and understand, make sure your text is coherent. Um, and this requires that there are no contradictions in your text. It has to be consistent, but on a textual level, you need cohesion. All textual links should be clear. One thing that often goes wrong is the term this. If you say blah, 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 this, then often you have to wonder, hmm, what does this refer to? And that can be quite vague often. Uh, unnecessary information, it can re be replaced by a noun sometimes. If uh, a connection can be and or transition works, words like however, but please don't use however all the time. I always say use one however maximum in a paragraph, other people, readers get lost. You say something, however, however, and where are we? So I would like to talk about the glue, what makes something cohere or fit together. And I make a distinction between referential and inferential relations. Now, what are referential relations? You refer to your study in a larger field of research or to a larger project or another publication, something in the text. It can be done at a local level or a big level. Now, these are actually not that difficult, yeah, referring to other things, but they are important. Far more interesting is what I call inferential relations, things like how are the question and answer related, or the premise and the conclusion, or um, the means to an end, or this is a reason for that. Those are often far more difficult to get straight. Um, now, I have a few guidelines in, in my book. I have a whole chapter on these issues, but I mention a few. Um, it's a very good exercise if you're writing, both at beginning, during, and end, to try and summarize your main message in just one sentence. And it can be very difficult, uh, but it helps to focus and build your text around it. This is a small issue, but nevertheless uh, helps, I think. Uh, people sometimes think they need to vary their terminology, and that's fine, but if you're writing about an educational unit, 
we should not call it a module in the next section or an instructional sequence or a series because people will get confused. Is this unit the same as the module? Uh, if you have one technical term, use only that one. This is not a novel, this is scientific reporting. And the same holds for problem stuff, activities, learning activities. Just use one term, otherwise the reader gets confused. Um, this is back to the research functions, so make sure that uh, the research function of your study is clear. The reader wants to know if this is descriptive or if you're defining a term or if you're comparing, evaluating, etc. And that needs to be consistent with your question and your methods. This helps a lot actually to make text coherent. Functional, um, I think I said this before, only introduce elements that you need. Um, you may otherwise raise expectations that you cannot fulfill. Now the Russian playwright Chekhov said, eh, you should never place a rifle on stage if it isn't going to go off. So avoid introducing all kinds of things that the reader thinks, oh, I need to remember this, and then you never use it in the analysis or in your results or even in the discussion. That's, that's uh, not so nice to the reader. It makes it less coherent. And the other way around, if you want to avoid that something happens out of the blue, make sure you prepare it earlier on in the text. Now, there is time for questions on coherence, and I saw some questions coming in, so let me see what Laia is asking. Oh, back to the question, number of questions. I think I talked about this before. Uh, as I said, I would propose to stick to one main question, possibly two, but never more than four sub-questions. Um, it could be, like, I've never seen like four sub-studies in one article, but of course there can always be exceptions, but uh, um, there is something nice about three. Uh, somehow, rhetorics works well with three or one. So, I'm waiting to see if there are questions on coherence. I do know that this is not the easiest topic. Maybe you want to read more about it and, and struggle with it yourself. Um, I loved getting insights into yeah, I love the puzzle of making a text more coherent. Aidan Kaplan, what about the limitations of the paper? Where should it be written? Ah, good. Uh, the discussion, so somewhere near the end. So um, what I could talk about, uh, if you like, is um, because I have not had time so far, is about the, the things people expect in the discussion section. So. Uh, I'm practicing the word hyperboloid. Now we um, start general, we draw the reader in, and at the end we move out again, right? So a typical um, uh, typical discussion has certain elements. Um, let me see if I can write it down. So what I typically advise for a discussion section is uh, repeat the, the goal or question first, and then uh, discuss the findings. I am typing. Um, then talk about limitations and recommendations. Um, and recommendations could be both for research and for educational practice. Um, I would like to say that uh, one limitation that I do not find very interesting to read is the small number. Um, because you, if you do your research, you know the number roughly in, in advance. So why, why bother to talk, yeah, yeah, we had only 12 interviews, etc. This is only a limitation if you manage to get far fewer people than you hoped to get. Um, 
So this is just to emphasize it. What you're writing there as a limitation should be really a limitation of your study and not something that you could have known in advance. Yeah. If it's part of your methodological consideration, say the number of participants, then you can state this in the method section already. And limitations are really for things that turn out during the research or have to be taken into account if others are learning about your study. Um, the number of questions, yes, I have. I'm looking at Joyce now. You talked about using only one term. What is it like when I generally talk about term framework? But then a specific one is called a model. Ah, yeah, that's a very interesting one. Uh, this is indeed a dilemma if you do a review of the literature that you have your own preferred term. We are actually struggling with this now uh, with misinterpretations of graphs. Um, some people call this misconceptions, other call it mistakes, some call it misinterpretations. And what do we do? Now, we have taken this approach that we say, okay, we, we use the umbrella term of misinterpretations for things that people talk about in terms of misconceptions, mistakes, errors, etc. And then we explain why we prefer that term. Um, and I think in your case, if you uh, summarize different frameworks, and some authors call it a model, I think it helps to uh, explain to the reader that you use the, frame, the term framework as an umbrella term for what other authors call things like models, frameworks, uh, etc. Okay, Shireen, inferential relations, was, what does it refer to? Ah, uh, inference means drawing conclusions, so it has to do with logic. Um, I hope that I made clear, but I can clarify more. Um, so a reference refers is, is some a reference is uh, this refers to that. There is sort of a um, pointing, so to speak. Uh, if you refer to an article, that's a referential relation. But Inference means conclusion or a reasoning step. Uh, that's a different nature. So if, um, if you want to achieve an end or a goal, you need certain tools or means. And uh, describing this is, a, is an inferential relation, or the relation between a premise and a conclusion is also inferential. Or if you raise a question, people expect an answer. That's that's sort of an issue of logic. Um, it's in the meaning of question and expectations around the term question that you expect an answer. Um, and there are many, many different kinds of inferential relations. But to me, it has to do with reasoning and with logic. I hope I answered Shireen. AV. There are some advice out there that when writing a paper, one should start from the conclusion and then move, etc. Yeah, I see this sometimes that people uh, give away, so to speak, their main conclusion and then then um, dive into it. Um, I think this works in some cases. Uh, it helps. Um, to give the reader a sense of what this paper is about. So, um, yeah, in the cases where I saw this done well, I really liked it. Um, but sometimes it's not so easy to do so because you need a conclusion is never sort of true in general, right? It has it is true for your situation, your approach to it, and your conceptualization, etc. So um, it's definitely something to consider to, to do such a thing. Um, and it would be interesting to think for myself more deeply when this makes sense. Um, 
but yes, you're right. It could be it could be worth doing in some cases, and I'm happy to think later if there are exceptions and under what conditions. Joanna, I'm not sure I understood quite well the issue on limitations. How can I? Oh, it's moving around. Differentiate real limitations from other limitations. Yes, yes, I understand that. I and this is a bit of a. To be honest, this is quite a subtle issue. Um, the reason is that I, if if students of mine or or PhD students or or uh, colleagues um, only come up with a small number of participants, I think well, well, this is not so interesting a, a limitation. Uh, plus, you you knew this in advance, so um, I. The general rule I could formulate, but this is quite spontaneous. If you know a limitation, so to speak, of in advance, it should be part of your methodological considerations. If it is something that you realize afterwards or that is really a problem during the research, for instance, attrition or people dropping out of the research or things uh, not being implemented in the way you hoped, then it was really a limitation. It was something you realized or that happened during the research. And I think you should think uh, as a reader, what do I need to know about this study that I that is relevant, that could be different in my case? Um, because if Research is always situated in a country, in a situation, uh, the researchers matter. And you, you want to think as a reader, what in this is really interesting for me? And if I use this idea or this finding or this tool, what else should I notice? What should I look for? And then it's important to know what are the restrictions or the limitations uh, about what um, is is done here so again Joanna, i think thanks for the excellent question um it's certainly worth thinking more about this Ufa, welcome what characterizes a good review paper um another uh, interesting one um i recently reviewed one paper that just gave an overview of one aspect, I can't say exactly what, uh, but it was an overview without any attempt to synthesize or to take a position about it or have an opinion about it. I think this is, this may sound very scientific, uh, very objective, and yet it didn't work. So I think why spend a year or more on writing a review paper becoming familiar with it if you're not helping the reader to make sense of it and, and provide a synthesis. So the short answer, I think, is a review paper should always synthesize to come up with a, a message above the singular studies uh, and do more than just give an overview. Um, of course, we could also talk about things like and the process needs to be transparent, but I think those are quite obvious methodological uh, issues. Um, I also like review papers that manage to come up with sort of uh, clearer conceptualization that help to define the phenomenon better. I'm moving to Helena, a good commentary paper. Well, wow, this is a very difficult one because it really depends. I don't think there is a very clear structure for a commentary paper. Of course, the content needs to be convincing. And um, uh, you could look at commentaries that really helped you understand something. I, I think I, I, I can think of a few commentary papers that really um, nailed the issue down. And by this I mean that they were spot on, that they grabbed or pointed to something that 
that is uh, important. Uh, maybe one example. Morgan Sneese last year gave a keynote at PME, and he wrote a paper for the learning of mathematics on the multifaceted nature of mathematics education. Now, in a very brief text, he points to uh, certain aspects of mathematic education research, which I find very convincing. Um, and I thought that was a good uh, commentary paper. So, you know, it's very hard to give quality uh, criteria for such things. I think they need to convince, be clear and concise. So, thanks again. I'm moving to the question, can you explain the research functions? Okay, yes. Um, research can have different functions. Um, and as I said, the typical starting point is often to describe. You conceptualize, you describe the situation, you give characteristics um, by using certain concepts. You see the phenomena in a particular way. So that is to describe. Um, but research can also be evaluative. You can evaluate certain interventions, for instance, or you want to know how well students do with a particular topic. And why this is important is that it, if you are aware of the function, everything in the paper needs to be at the service of this function. So in an evaluative paper, you need to expect um, certain assessment criteria, a standard, and you need a judgment of how well something was the case, or how good or and how successful. Now, if you, if you, if your research is mainly to give advice to teachers or to, to designers or whoever, and giving advice builds often on, say, evaluative work. Uh, so there is a certain logic from describing, evaluating to giving advice. You cannot really give advice if you don't have any basis for it. Um, but I could recommend certain literature, if you like, on that explains uh, research functions uh, better. Uh, apart from my own book, I refer to Geert Plom's work, uh, but I can add references later. Hi, Aiden. When writing results, what do we follow? Presenting data or save the results and present data? Ah, yeah, this is a matter of uh, order. Um, this is again a, a, a more general issue. Um, think of paragraphs, right? A small bit of text, Alinea in Dutch and some other languages. You first have the, the key and then explanation, or do you work towards the key sentence? Now, I think in today's sort of uh, quick uh, society, people like to have boom and then explanation. First, the result, and then where it came from. They are impatient, so to speak. They don't have the patience to go through all the details and see with you to come there. So. Um, in general, and this is very difficult to say, I would say um, help the impatient reader a little bit, but not too much. Um, so it helps to have like summaries. Um, as you were saying, um, you can say, okay, this is what we found and this is uh, more the data, but again, there is no general rule for this. Uh, you would have to see how it works in your specific case. Now, Ustang, uh, footnote. Yeah, footnotes. It's a, it's a, most journals don't like footnotes. Um, They're more common in books. And uh, the trouble with footnotes is that you have to jump. And readers don't like this. And in a journal article, you don't really need uh, mostly, there are no footnotes. Sometimes there are endnotes for, for, for things that interrupt the flow of the argumentation. But 
my advice more normally is just avoid, try to avoid footnotes. And some journals have strict rules on this. Um, <clears throat> Nantana, is it ethical to use the same or more than once? Yeah, this is another interesting issue. I had this issue uh, just a few days ago where people use the same data for multiple articles or use almost the same title uh, for a number of papers. And it's actually quite a, a diff, uh, difficult uh, topic. I personally think that you can use the same transcript for multiple purposes as long as it is clear that each paper has its own different purpose and research question. Now, in today's age, people are really worried about what they call salami slicing. I will type it here. So, um, trying to get as many papers as, as possible from one single data set. And this is really something to be avoided. Reviewers really hate it if they see a very similar paper with just slightly different findings or uh, the same data set used uh, 20 times. Um, so this is something to be care careful about. I, I just read a paper called Deja Lu, which means uh, read uh, before. Sorry, I, I, um, I can give the reference later. It's about uh, practices of reusing data for other purposes. And uh, one thing that is important to note, it, to note here is that uh, if you use a data set again for a different purpose, I'm not talking not just transcript, but data set, uh, it's good to uh, tell the editor in an editorial letter um, that you do use the same data set, but for a different purpose. And that really helps to make things transparent if you can't do it in the paper itself. But uh, yes, uh, somehow all these ethics and integrity issues are really upcoming internationally and people get more and more clear and transparent and um, uh, yeah, conscious about these issues. So thanks for asking that uh, issue. It's a broader issue of being transparent about reusing data for different purposes. Now, let me see um, if we write an article based on our thesis, like a dissertation, a PhD edition, should we mention this in the article? Um, this, I think, um, it's also hard to say this in general. Um, if there is overlapping text that is really like more than say 20, 25, 30%, you always need to, to state this somewhere. Um, so again, the, the worry about self-plagiarism is really big today. And so the more transparent you can be, the better uh, it is. And um, one thing to note also here is, is, is your thesis published or not? I'm in the United States, it's not so common to publish uh, dissertations. They will be online maybe, but not published as a book. But in Europe, for instance, it's much more common to publish your dissertation as a book. And then it's harder to, to publish the same thing as an article. Or you should keep the thesis uh, on hold uh, under embargo, as they call it, until the journal article is published and then uh, it may be different. So again, it's not such an easy question to answer, but the, the easy answer is uh, be transparent as you can about um, where things have been published uh, before and on what they are based. So let me see if there is anything new. I think we covered a lot of questions. Um, I don't see any new questions, so I'm going to ask to Andrea and their colleagues Dorota and Silan if if we're 
ready for today. If there are any leftovers. Well, we, we had a lot of talk today and a lot of questions. So if there are no other questions, maybe it's time to, to go. I see one more question by Faten. Let me have a look if I can. What's the maximum length of a transcript? Oh, that's another excellent one. Uh, what I learned from Norma Presmek, who was editor in chief for uh, a long time or a longer time before me, um, don't make it too long. Uh, like half a page is about, I would say, what a reader can handle. Uh, a full page in a journal article is most readers just don't have the patience to go through it. Moreover, there are risks with long transcripts um, because you could stick too close to the data. That's one problem. Another problem is that it's not so reader friendly. What, what the reader wants to see is your analysis of it. So you would have to introduce a transcript and then see how you analyze it, what you, what you got out of it. And if your transcript is too long, you, you leave too much of the analysis to the, to the reader. Now, there are probably exceptions to this. Um, but uh, for me, I would use the rule of thumb as a maximum half a page. And if you really need more, you could consider an appendix or uh, online materials. Um, that's the more general advice if, if things are important for your research but don't fit in the maximum length of a journal article, there are always options to put things online. Elena, is it possible to get this presentation for, for personal research? Yes, the PowerPoint will be online and the, the talk, the webinar is recorded, so it will stay online. Chiara, a mixed methods um, in which you use the quantitative analysis to make emergent phenomena from larger scale assessment, then interpret qualitatively. Yeah, so you're basically talking about two-step uh, research. Yeah, this happens uh, quite often uh, from large scale to small scale, or also sometimes the other way around, that people start with um, getting to understand the phenomenon better and then scale up to larger, uh, larger scale questionnaires. Um, yeah, it really depends how rich uh, the studies are. If um, sometimes that you see that people split it up in two parts. So they write the findings of the larger scale questionnaire uh, as, a, as an independent study. Um, and then write a second article in which they dive deeper for explanations. But um, if the first study, so to speak, is not rich enough or sort of not satisfactory without further explanation, then it makes sense to combine into one paper. So that goes back to the salami slicing problem. Um, if you have the data, try to fit it into one article because it's a richer story. And don't try to make as many publications as possible. Um, but of course, in your case, I don't know uh, what is the issue. But uh, you may need even two different studies, like its own method section. Um, and that, that's another problem. We can't dive into this in a, in a, in a minute. Um, how you how you write up multiple studies in one article? That's a skill in itself. There are different options. Um, do we need to include transcripts in the paper each code or idea? No, it has to be uh, readable or legible. Um, in a code book, it could be very nice to have at least some transcripts that uh, clarify your codes. But if it's too much, if you have like 20 codes, uh, you could consider an appendix or uh, online materials. But what I sometimes see and do myself also is to take two examples of an example and a non-example or the two main 
important code and give a transcript uh, an example of that so that the reader at least gets a sense of uh, um, yeah what this is based on and also to make the, the whole procedure transparent but you can never be complete it's impossible to read if you if you make every step completely transparent I hope that answers the question there. And given that it is almost time, I would suggest, Andrea, that you uh, close off. I at least would like to thank everyone for participating. It's great to see that we had so many above 50 uh, all the time. And uh, I really enjoy uh, talking about quality of writing and also the excellent questions that I would like to think more about. Um, so um, thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur. We really want to thank you for accepting our invitation. And the fact that most of the people stayed here during the whole webinar is, is a, a signal that they really enjoyed your talk. And I can say that I did. So this was the first webinar in a series that is going to go on. We are already preparing the, the next webinar that will take place likely in October. But we will keep you all updated through the, the social networks of the Army, so on Facebook, on uh, Twitter and on Instagram, and also by email if you are in the mailing list of Ermi. I wish to, to thank also Dorota Lember, who is helping me, working with me in organizing all these webinars. And also, I want to give a special thank to uh, Dylan. You have seen her modifying the, the window and showing you the, the question. She, she's really the, the person who is practically creating the, this room and managing it. So a uh, great thank you to Dylan. Uh, some last info before you run away. Uh, you can see now in the page at the very left bottom some links to the Yerma website, the Yerma page in the Yerma website, and the website of ES 2020 that is going to take place in Greece. So I really invite you to, to give a look to those pages, and especially to the page of Yes, because the, uh, the announcement uh, of the, for the summer school was released, and so it's time to think if you want to take part to it. Of course, these webinars are really good opportunities we have to, to keep in contact, but I'm pretty sure that participating to Yes and to Yerma Day will give you much more insight about the activity of Yermi and the possibility to interact with experts as you did today with Arthur. So thank you again for participating and to remain till the end. I hope to, to see you soon in the next webinars or in the next activities by Yermi. And please feel free to write to me or Dorota for any need that you feel as young researchers in uh, mathematics education in the European context. Thank you and goodbye. Bye bye.